Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Julian Siggers, and I have the great honor of being the Williams Director here at the Penn Museum. And I'd like to welcome you here this evening in our next of our series of Great Battles lectures. Tonight, we will hear about the siege and fall of Masada in the first century BCE, presented by Dr. Jody Magnus. Now, I first met Jody about five years ago in Jerusalem when she was getting ready to come to give a lecture on the Dead Sea Scrolls at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. It's a very long lecture series, and I can tell you without any hesitation that this was the best lecture in the entire series, so you should be in for a treat. Dr. Magnus holds a senior endowed chair in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the Kennan Distinguished Professor for Teaching Excellence in Early Judaism. She received a BA in Archaeology and History from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and her PhD in Classical Archaeology from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Magnus was the Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Syro-Palestinian Archaeology at the Center of Old World Archaeology and Art at Brown University. Dr. Magnus has published numerous books focusing on Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Early Islamic Settlement in Palestine, The Archaeology of the Holy Land, Jewish Daily Life in Ancient Times, and Ceranic Chronology at Jerusalem in the early centuries of the Common Era. In addition, Dr. Magnus has published dozens of articles and journals and edited volumes. Her research interest would focus on Palestine in the Roman, Byzantine, and early Islamic periods, and the diaspora of Judaism in the Roman world include ancient pottery, ancient synagogues, and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Roman army in the East. She has participated in 20 different ex excavations in Israel and Greece, including co-directing the 1995 excavations in the Roman siege works at Masada, and has co-directed excavations in the late Roman fort of Yoftava in Israel. Since 2011, Dr. Magnus has directed an excavation at Okok in Galilee. She's received numerous fellowships and teaching awards, and is a consultant and featured expert on an IMAX film on Jerusalem scheduled to be released this summer. And I've seen a few clips of that, and I highly recommend it. She'll be signing books after this presentation in our bookstore, but please welcome Dr. Jody Magnus. Great. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and I always love to come back to Philadelphia not just because I'm an alumna of the University of Pennsylvania, but I'm actually a third generation Philadelphian. And I love to come here uh, because my accent does not sound out of place when I'm here. So, uh, and people don't complain that I talk too fast. Uh, anyway, um, I am going to be giving you an overview of the Siege of Masada. And in order to do this, I'm actually going to start by giving you um, an introduction to the archaeology of Masada, take you, taking you on a very quick tour of Herod's palaces on top of Masada, but I am going to focus most of my time on the siege of Masada, the Roman siege of Masada, which is the part of the story that is less well known to the public um, and is less well known to most people who have visited Masada. Before I go on, by the way, is the microphone level okay? Yes. It is okay, okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so that's what I'm going to be doing, and um, what I'd like to, um, before I even start, let me just say two things. I am going to refer to the area that today is modern Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian territories as Palestine. I'm using that in the ancient sense of the word without any reference to the modern political con conflict, so I will be using the word Palestine to refer to this geographical area. That's number one. Number two, um, because I am giving a lecture here in a general context, I am going to use the terms BC and AD instead of BCE and CE. So that's just so we're all on the same wavelength. Okay, so just to get started, um, how many of you, by the way, have actually been to Masada? Hands up. Oh, okay, wow, great, all right. So some of you will know some of this will look familiar, okay. So Masada is located on the southwest shore of the Dead Sea. You see in the upper slide a map of the area of the Dead Sea. You see the Mediterranean off in the upper left-hand corner with Tel Aviv there. You see Jerusalem in the middle of the map. And here along the Dead Sea, you see Jericho to the north, 
the site of Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found at the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. If you continue south along the western shore of the Dead Sea, you pass the oasis at Angedi, and at the southwest side of the Dead Sea, you reach the mountain of Masada. And here in the lower slide, you see an aerial view of the mountain of Masada with the Dead Sea in the background. And I always like to explain that the name Masada in Hebrew is Mitzada, so the name of the site in Hebrew is Mitzada, not Masada as we say in English. And like all Hebrew words, that name means something. It comes from the Hebrew word meaning fort or fortress. So the name for Masada actually is fort or fortress, and the reason is that this mountain is a natural fortress. What makes it a natural fortress is not that it's higher than any of the other mountains in the area, not that it's flatter on top, but what makes Masada a natural fortress is the fact that it is isolated on all sides from all of the other mountains. So it's very difficult to get up to the top of it, and so it is a good natural fortress. Already 2,000 years ago, the potential of Masada as a fortress was recognized by King Herod the Great. And now just a couple of words about Herod. Herod was appointed king of Judea by the Romans in the year 40 BC, and he ruled until his death in the year 4 BC. When Herod was appointed king of the Romans by, uh, king of the Jews by the Romans in the year 40 BC, uh, he uh, faced a number of challenges or problems. One of the problems that Herod faced was the fact that the Jewish population in his kingdom did not like him and did not accept him as a legitimate king, one of the reasons being that he was not descended from the native Jewish dynasty, the Hasmonean dynasty, um, but instead was actually half Jewish. He was uh, half Jewish on his father's side of the family through forced conversion. His mother was not Jewish, so he was a half Jew who was not a member of the native, who was not a descendant of the native Jewish dynasty, the Hasmoneans. He was instead imposed uh, on the Jews by the Romans, so they did not like him, they did not accept him as a legitimate king. So one of the problems that Herod faced throughout his reign was the uh, discontent of the local Jewish population. In order to deal with this problem, Herod did several things. One thing that he did was to try to win the loyalty, win the favor of the Jewish population by rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, rebuilding the second temple. It didn't work, by the way. They didn't like him any better because of that, but he did try that. Um, another thing that Herod did, though, was because he knew that the Jewish population did not like him, uh, he lived his life in fear that one day the Jews would rise up in revolt against him and try to kill him. And so he built a line of fortified palaces on the edge of his kingdom to serve as potential places of refuge in case of a Jewish revolt. So when we look at uh, Herod's kingdom here on the map, at the southern edge of the kingdom and along the boundary are a series of these fortresses or fortified palaces, and we can go all the way from the Jordan Valley here, Alexandrium Sartaba, to the area of Jericho where there are a couple of fortresses, to the area behind Qumran where there's another fortress, Horkania, to the other side of the Dead Sea in Jordan today where there's a fortress called Machiris, to the area of Bethlehem where there's another one called Herodium, and all the way down to Masada. So Masada is just one in a line of fortified palaces that Herod built for himself to serve as potential places of refuge in case of a Jewish revolt against him. Masada is just the most famous of this line of fortified palaces. Now, if we look at what Herod did when he came to build Masada to build his fortified palaces, what did he do? There are basically two main kinds of buildings on top of Masada. Number one, the fortifications, and number two, the palaces. What we see on the top slide here is a plan of Masada. It is oriented so that north is to the left, the left-hand side of the slide. And on the left-hand side of the slide here, we see a photograph of the top of Masada where the northern tip of the mountain is oriented to the top of the slide. So first of all, we can see that Herod fortified the top of Masada by building a fortification wall that goes all the way around the edge of the mountain. You can see it here as a gray strip going around the edge, and we can see it here in this aerial view, these rooms that form a wall that go around the edge of the mountain. If you look carefully at these slides, you will see that this wall was not a solid wall, but instead it was a wall that consisted of a strip of rooms 
that completely goes around the edge of the site. So the wall actually has rooms in it. This is a particular kind of a wall that's called a casemate wall. It's not an uncommon kind of fortification wall in antiquity. And the reason is that a casemate wall was a very useful kind of fortification wall. You could store your arsenal of weapons in it. You could garrison your soldiers in it. So you could use those rooms for various purposes. So running around the edge of the site, Herod built a casemate wall. There were towers along the length of the wall, and there were gates leading in and out of the wall to provide access to the top of the mountain. Within the area that was fortified, Herod built two main palace complexes. One palace complex at the northern tip of the mountain, which you see here, and the other palace complex on the western side of the mountain, which you see here, and archaeologists today call these the northern palace complex and the western palace complex. Both of the palace complexes contained the actual palatial rooms, so the bedrooms and the living room and all of that that belonged to the actual palace, plus all of the service rooms that went along with that. So you had storerooms for food, you had servants' quarters, bathhouses. So uh, when I say complex, it means palace rooms plus all of the other rooms that served the palace. And that's what you have in both of these palace complexes. Um, if you visited Masada, then undoubtedly you remember the northern palace complex located here at the northern tip. You remember it because it is situated spectacularly going over the edge of the northern cliff here, uh, located on three terraces that originally were connected by staircases. Here you can see the northern palace complex with a dining room or reception hall on the lowest terrace, a patio or porch on the middle terrace, and the bedrooms in the uppermost terrace with all of the service rooms located behind. One of the most striking things about visiting Masada today is going all the way out into the middle of the desert, the middle of the Judean desert, where there's, no, there's nothing around for miles, and you come to Herod's palaces, and you see that they were spectacularly decorated in the latest Roman fashion. And so, for example, in the uppermost slide here, we see the lowest terrace of the northern palace complex decorated with beautiful wall paintings and stuccoed columns, originally gilded Corinthian capitals. Here at the bottom, you see a close-up of these wall paintings, which are indeed in the latest Roman style, the second Pompeian style. And here on the left, you see a mosaic floor that decorated the entrance to the throne room in the, northern, in the western palace complex. So all of this gives you an idea of the lavishness of the decoration of the palatial rooms on top of Masada. Now, because Masada is located in the middle of the desert, there's very little rainfall. There are no sources of food or water in the immediate vicinity. So when Herod built his palaces on top of the mountain, he also had to provide for storage for lots of food and water. And when Yigael Yadin, the Israeli archaeologist, excavated the top of Masada in the middle of the 1960s, and he excavated the storerooms, he found remains of food that were still preserved that could still be identified. What I show you here on the left are some of the pieces of food, the remains of the food that Yadin found in his excavations in the 1960s. And looking at them, you can still identify easily what these things are today. For example, in the middle top, can anybody tell what those are? Those are walnuts, that's right. Next to them, upper left, can you tell what those are? Those are dates, that's right. And these are date pits that you have here on this side. And in the lower right, can you tell what those are? Those are pomegranates, that's right. And then next to them, you have various kinds of seeds, including olive pits. And this stuff in the lower left corner, uh, what is that? Now, by the way, I have to tell you a very funny story. Uh, a number of years ago, I gave this lecture to an audience of Virginia, and I asked what this was, and one of the people in the audience said it was grits. And I said, <laughs> That's right. I said, yes, well, Masada is in the south, but it's not that south. So, uh, so anyway, uh, this is not grits. This is something that you have a lot of in the area of the Dead Sea. That's salt. That's right. So those are chunks of salt because, of course, in antiquity, there was no refrigeration, so you preserved your food by salting it. So, uh, so Herod's storehouses were provided with lots of food. 
How did he get water? Well, there are a series of gigantic cisterns on Masada, um, which were uh, filled with water. There are also numerous smaller pools for, for storing water. Here we see one of the cisterns. The main group of cisterns at Masada is located on the northwest side of the mountain. So here in the right slide, you see the northern palace above us. So you see the step terraces of the northern palace. And then you see on the northwest side, two rows of cisterns here and here. Do you see the openings to them, right? So a whole bunch side by side, and these cisterns were filled up by water that was brought by aqueduct from some of the nearby riverbeds. Now I know that it looks like the water would have had to have flowed up, but it's actually not the case. If you could go to Masada and look there, you'd see that there are riverbeds in the area that are at this level. And uh, the riverbeds are usually dry riverbeds, but in the winter time, on very rare occasions, you'll have flash floods in those dry riverbeds, and the flash flood water would flow through the aqueducts and fill up these rows of cisterns. And you only needed one flash flood to fill up all of these cisterns. Now what you see here then on the uh, left is the interior of one of these cisterns at Masada. There are 18 cisterns of this size at Masada and numerous smaller pools for storing water. This particular cistern, by the way, like all of them, is hewn completely out of bedrock and it was plastered with thick layers of plaster on the walls and on the floor. In fact, this is not the floor of the cistern. It continues down, so it was even bigger than what you see in this slide. And it's been estimated that every one of these cisterns held enough drinking water for a thousand people for a year. So again, you can see that Herod provided uh, lots of food and lots of water to be stored on top of Masada. Now, it's ironic then that after Herod went to all of this trouble to fortify Masada, to build these palaces, to store food and water, and not just Masada, but all of those other palace fortresses that I mentioned, after he did all of that, he was not killed by the Jews. He did not die as the result of a Jewish revolt against him. In fact, Herod got sick and died in the year 4 BC. So in the year 4 BC, Herod dies, and what happens after that? At this point, the Jews already were discontent with Roman rule. They didn't like Herod. They didn't like the guys who came after Herod, which included Herod's sons and then a series of Roman procurators or prefects, low-ranking governors, basically. And so Jewish discontent continued to grow through the first century AD until finally in the year 66 AD, that is 70 years after Herod's death, a Jewish revolt broke out against the Romans. We call that revolt the first Jewish revolt against the Romans. Now, when that revolt broke out in the year 66, small bands of Jewish rebels took over some of Herod's fortified palaces and so in the year 66 AD, a band of Jewish rebels came and occupied the top of Masada for the duration of the revolt. The revolt then lasted for four years until the year 70 AD when the Romans took Jerusalem, and when they took Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, the second temple in Jerusalem, and the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the second temple officially mark the end of the first Jewish revolt against the Romans. But what? But after the fall of Jerusalem in 70, there still remained three former fortified Herodian palace fortresses in the hands of Jewish rebels. These three fortresses, which were still in the hands of Jewish rebels after 70, were Herodium, located near Bethlehem, Machiris, located on the other side of the Dead Sea, and Masada. So after the fall of Jerusalem in 70, the Romans sent troops to take each of these three fortresses. The first fortress that the Romans marched against was Herodium. Herodium apparently fell quickly, almost without a fight. Then the Romans went to Machiris. There was a siege at Machiris, and Machiris fell. And finally, the Romans arrived at the foot of Masada, the last fortress still holding out in the hands of Jewish rebels. They arrived either in the year 72 or 73 AD. There is a debate about the chronology. 
So the Romans arrived at the foot of Masada, where at this point the top of the mountain was in the hands of Jewish rebels. Specifically, 967 Jewish rebels occupied the top of Masada at this point. Not 967 soldiers, but 967 men, women, and children, because these were families. Against these 967 men, women, and children, the Romans sent a force of somewhere around eight to 10,000 men. A little bit of Roman overkill. Uh, it always reminds me, by the way, of that scene in my favorite movie, Monty Python's Life of Brian, where the entire Roman army seems to go into that little apartment looking for Jewish rebels, right? So it's something like that. And it's very interesting, by the way, that the Romans sent such a large force against such a small band of rebels. It really is overkill. And it makes you wonder what's going on, because, because after all, what did the Romans care if a small band of Jews held out on the top of a mountain in the middle of the wilderness at the edge of the Roman Empire. Why not just pack it up and go home? They already had their victory parade in Rome, and you know, so why not just pack it up and go home? Well, there were two things. First of all, there was the matter of Roman prestige. You did not want, symbolically, to give a message to other native peoples living under your rule that you could get away with this sort of thing, and that a small band of rebels could hold out against the mighty Roman Empire, that's number one, and number two, a very real fear that if the Romans withdrew, that the uh, rebels on top of Masada would then be able to come down from the top of the mountain and reignite the revolt all over again. So it was very important to the Romans to stamp out every last spark of Jewish resistance and thereby set an example for all of those other peoples who they ruled over. So they sent this huge force to take a fairly small group of people. So when the Romans arrived at the foot of Masada, they set up a siege. And this is where I think things really begin to get, to get interesting. Because we have at Masada the best preserved examples of Roman siege works from anywhere in the Roman world. This gives us an opportunity archeologically to see how the Romans conducted a siege. Why are the siege works at Masada so well preserved? They're well preserved for two reasons. Number one, the siege works at Masada, as we will see, are built of stone, because that's what you had, the local building material was stone. There are stones lying around on the ground and the Romans built their siege works. They built everything of stone. So the stone has survived, whereas in Europe, Siege works typically were made of soil and, and wood, the kinds of materials that generally are not well preserved after thousands of years. So first of all, the materials themselves did not disintegrate. And second, because Masada is located in a remote wilderness area in the remote desert, the siege works were never built over and destroyed afterwards. So we can still see them today. So this gives us a wonderful opportunity to examine how the Roman army operated during a siege, how they conducted a siege. So what happens? The Roman troops arrive at the foot of Masada, and they do, first of all, two things. Number one, they set up or build a circumvallation wall, a wall, that completely encircles the base of the mountain. So in the slide, let me explain what you're looking at here. In the slide on the left, you're looking at a plan of Masada and the siege works. So this is the mountain of Masada, the top of Masada here. The Dead Sea is off the slide here, but it would be off to the, to the right, so north is at the top. Both slides are oriented so that north is at the top. So there's Masada, and here is the wall that the Romans built around the foot of the mountain. It's approximately 4,000 yards long completely encircling the base of the mountain. You can see it also in the aerial view on the right where you see the mountain of Masada here. Okay, so north again is at the top. And here you see the circumvallation wall. Now, a circumvallation wall is a characteristic type of Roman siege wall. So whenever the Romans would conduct a siege, the first, one of the first things that they would do would be to build this kind of wall completely encircling the town or the city or the fortress or whatever it was that they were besieging. This wall was approximately 10 to 12 feet high originally. It had watchtowers along it where they could post guards. And the reason for building a wall like this was in order to seal off the besieged. So that all of the people now on top of Masada were stuck there, nobody could leave, and nobody could get in to help them. So you seal off the site that you're besieging by building this circumvallation wall. 
The second thing that the Romans did was to build a series of camps that encircle the base of Masada, and there are eight camps at all at Masada, in all at Masada, which we label with letters beginning with A. So I'm going to point them out to you here. A, so we're on the lower east side here, the, the sort of uh, southeast side of Masada. Okay, A, B, C, D, E, F, G is always really hard to see, there it is, G and H, okay? And you can see some of them also in the aerial view, A, B, C, D, E, F, G is, uh, G is actually off, oh, there it is, G and H, okay? Now, what were the camps for? The camps, of course, housed the Roman soldiers who were participating in the siege. They were spread around the base of the mountain. They weren't all clumped together, but they were distributed strategically around the base of the mountain in order to guard potential routes of escape. Furthermore, if you look at the camps closely, you will see a couple of interesting things. Can you see that nearly all of the camps are laid out in the same way as a square with the sides face facing the cardinal points, north, south, east and west, right? So they're all pretty much laid out in the same way. The Roman army was successful and efficient because it operated in a standardized manner. If you served in the Roman army at this point, you served as a career soldier. This was career service. So when you signed up, it was for a lifetime of service. Roman soldiers were trained to operate in the field in a specific way and in a highly standardized way so that whenever they came to a site, they set up things in exactly the same way. So the Roman camps that we see at Masada are laid out just like any typical Roman siege camp would be anywhere, and that means that they are in a, uh, laid out as a square with the sides oriented towards the cardinal points. Now, another thing that I want you to notice is, can you see that despite the fact that they are all laid out more or less as a square with the sides facing the cardinal points, that they vary in size? And you have two of the camps that are much bigger than the others, B and F. You see that? The other camps are smaller. Now, why is that? The size of these camps reflects the composition of the troops that participated in the siege at Masada. At this point, there were basically two kinds of soldiers that served in the Roman army, legionaries and auxiliaries. Legionaries, at this point, were drafted from Roman citizens. You had to be a Roman citizen to be a legionary. The legionaries were mainly the heavy infantry, the main part of the Roman army. Um, and at this point, a legion consisted of approximately 5,000 men, and there were approximately 28 legions all together in the Roman army at this time. We know that there was one legion that participated in the siege at Masada, and that was the 10th legion. Now, the other kind of soldier that you have in the army at this point are auxiliaries. Auxiliaries are those troops that literally assist the legionaries. They are actually the more mobile troops that protect the flanks of the heavy infantry in battle. So, for example, auxiliaries could include light infantry, cavalry, and archers. Auxiliaries were drafted from among non-Roman citizens. And by the way, the, uh, the advantage of serving, the, the, you know, what was attractive about serving as an auxiliary for signing up for a lifetime of service as an auxiliary was that after you finished your service, you and your family were given Roman citizenship. So what do we have at Masada? We have one legion, the 10th legion, of approximately 5,000 men, actually probably a little less than that at this point because it's after the uh, fall of Jerusalem and the 10th Legion had participated in the siege of Jerusalem and in other battles during the course of the revolt, so their, their number of their men was probably down somewhat. But at any rate, in theory, a legion, one legion of approximately 5,000 men, and the rest of the soldiers at Masada were auxiliary troops. So what we see in terms of the camps here reflects the composition of the troops where these two large camps, B and F, housed the legionary troops from the 10th Legion with approximately half of them camped in B and the other half in F. 
And the Roman commander at Masada, Flavius Silva, probably uh, splitting his time between those two camps, and the other smaller camps housing the auxiliary troops. Now, one last thing before we go on. Nothing about how the Roman army operated was casual. Everything had a reason. So why is Camp B, one of the two legionary camps, located here, and Camp F, the other legionary camp, located up at the uh, northwest side of the site? For very good reasons. B was located because this was the primary supply route to Masada. How did the Romans get supplies to Masada? We are in the middle of the desert. Where did they get supplies from? They had to bring supplies in for all of those troops, and not just those troops, slaves, pack animals, camp hangers on, every day during the siege, food and water for all of those men and all of those animals. Where were the supplies coming from? The supplies were coming from all over the country, including points to the north, the east, and the south. And those supplies were being brought then by boat on the Dead Sea and offloaded at a dock near Masada and then brought from the dock to the eastern side of Masada and then redistributed from Camp B. So Camp B is located in this spot because of the supply route. Camp F is located here because as we will see, this is the closest spot to the top of Masada, and from here, Flavia Silva could supervise the siege and could also supervise the construction of the siege ramp, which is located on the western side. So again, there is nothing casual about how any of this was laid out or operated. Now, if you go to Masada today, and again, many of you have been there, you can still see the siege works very clearly. For example, we are standing here on top of Masada and looking down to the southwest where we see Camp G. We see the circumvallation wall, and look at it, it goes right up the edge of that cliff. The Romans were very thorough. And you can see a path that runs along the inside of the circumvallation wall. This is a path which is an ancient path called the runner's path, which actually was the line of communication between the siege camps. Because, of course, in antiquity, there was no field telephone, no walkie-talkie. How did Flavia Silva get commands? How did he communicate with all of those soldiers in the other camps? He would send out slaves whose job it was to run from camp to camp with his commands. Did any of you ever see that Peter Ware film Gallipoli with a very young Mel Gibson? That's right. And you remember they were runners? That was in World War I, right? They were runners? Okay, so very much the same thing. This is the runner's path that connected the siege camps at Masada. Now, if you stand on top of Masada and look down to the northwest, you can see Camp F very clearly, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, on the left here, you see Camp E. You see the circumvallation wall going down the edge of the cliff. And again, you see the runner's path. So I want to focus here on Camp F. Because in the summer of 1995, I was privileged to co-direct the first and only excavations that have ever been conducted in the Roman siege works at Masada. You see, in the 1960s, when Yigael Yadin excavated at Masada, he focused his attention on the top of the mountain, not on the siege works. So the siege works had basically been left untouched until, together with three Israeli colleagues in the summer of 1995, we co-directed excavations. And we focused our attention on Camp F. So I want to explain to you what we see when we look at Camp F here. Um, on the right, you see a plan of the camp. And on the left, you see a photograph of it taken looking down from the top of Masada. Now, Camp F is laid out just like a typical Roman camp. It's a square with the sides facing the cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. But when you look at the drawing of it, at the plan, it doesn't look like a square. It looks like a trapezoid. The reason why is, because you can't see this, but when you're actually at Camp F, the ground here slopes very steeply down. So when you draw a plan of it, it looks like a trapezoid. But in fact, looking at it from above, you can see that it is laid out as a square like a typical Roman camp is. Now what do we see when we look inside Camp F? We can see that in the middle of each side is a gate, north gate, south gate, east, 
west. These gates originally led to two main thoroughfares that crisscross the camp. So one road going north-south, another road going east-west, and these two roads intersected in the center of the camp. Every, every Roman military camp was laid out like this. Where the two roads intersected in the center of the camp, the most important units were located, and we will talk about that, and then radiating out from the center, you had increasingly less important types of units. So all of this is standard to Roman military camps. One thing that is not standard to a Roman military camp is the thing that you see in the corner here, in the southwest corner of Camp F, what we call Camp F2. What is this? It is a camp within a camp. After the siege of Masada ended, the Romans left a small number of troops still camped in the old corner of Camp F for a very brief period until they were sure that the area was completely subdued. So Camp F2 is a, uh, is a phase that dates to immediately after the end of the siege and represents a very short period of occupation by a small number of troops that were left behind uh, to make sure that everything was calm. So here are the students, uh, some of the students that I took at the time when I went to Masada in 1995. I was teaching at Tufts University, so I took a bunch of students from Tufts University. We had some students from other universities as well. And you can see uh, they're surviving despite the fact that we excavated in June and July. Uh, they are surviving uh, okay. We did have shade claws, which helped. And one of the very interesting, there's a lot of really interesting things when you look at uh, the siege camps today, but one of the things is when you look at, at the, what remains today, and here we are again, we're looking down from the top of Masada with a sort of a zoom lens. Um, there are several things that strike you. First of all, the area looks very barren. It looks like you're not going to find very much. In fact, if you walk around the surface of the ground, you won't see much. You'll just see a lot of rocks strewn around. So it doesn't look very promising in terms of finding anything. And I, going into it in advance, I really had very low expectations. I was very surprised, therefore, when we found lots of stuff in the camps. So when we did excavate, there was a lot of stuff in there. So that was number one surprise. Another thing that I want to point out to you is the construction. Again, it's all stone construction, and it's dry stone rubble. It's field stones. So the Romans did not invest a lot of time and energy in building these walls. They basically took stones that were lying around on the surface of the ground and piled them up to build the walls. So the walls that you see here, the outer walls of the camp, including Camp F2, uh, are dry stone walls that originally were, let's say, 10 to 12 feet high, and what you see inside the camp are the remains of uh, low stone walls, dry stone walls again, but low stone walls that originally were only three to four feet high. And what do you see here? These, these low stone walls that originally were three to four feet high are not walls of buildings. They're not walls of buildings. They are foundations for tents. Because when the Roman army conducted a siege in the field, they pitched leather tents. So what you are looking at here inside the camp are low stone walls that were the basis for pitched leather tents. And each one of these was a tent unit. Now, um, another couple of things. Many people who visit Masada today, um, and maybe you were told this by your tour guide, or maybe not, but many people who visit Masada today have the mistaken impression that the siege lasted for three years. And the reason people think this is because Jerusalem fell in 70, and Masada fell either in 73 or 74. So the siege of Masada was either in the winter spring of 73, 74, or uh, 72, 73, or 73, 74. So because of that, a lot of people think that the siege of Masada lasted for three years. It did not, not even close. The siege of Masada lasted from a maximum of six months, a maximum, and that is highly unlikely, to a minimum of seven weeks. Seven weeks from beginning to end, from the point when the Roman army arrived at the foot of Masada till the time Masada fell, it could have been as short as seven weeks. The calculations have been done on that. Now, people find that hard to believe, but remember that the Roman army was a professional army. They were highly efficient. They all knew and they all were trained to do certain things. 
So when they arrived at the foot of Masada, they quickly went to work, they set up the siege works, and they started to attack the mountain, and so it is actually very feasible that the siege took place within, let's say, a matter of two months altogether. Now, um, the Romans were not stupid, by the way. They were smart. The siege took place over the course of the winter and spring. So they did not besiege the mountain in the summer when it's dry and it's hot. They conducted the siege in the winter time when it's cooler and when there is an occasional rainfall. And that is why the debate over the chronology is whether the siege occurred in the winter spring of 72-73 or 73-74, okay? So what did we do when we came to, the, uh, to, to do our excavations? When we came in the summer of 1995, we spent six weeks there. And of course, you couldn't do the whole siege works in six weeks. You couldn't even do a whole camp in six weeks. So we had to focus our attention. We decided to focus our attention on one camp. And we decided to focus our attention on Camp F. Why Camp F? Because we wanted to excavate one of the two legionary camps. And of the two legionary camps, Camp F is the better preserved. B is more eroded. So we focused our attention on Camp F, and within Camp F, we excavated a number of units, and you can see some of the units that we excavated that I've labeled here. Uh, here is uh, the area of F2, and you can see units labeled one, two, three, four, five. Okay, these are all units that we excavated. Now, uh, a couple of things of what you're looking at. You can see very clearly here the areas that we are excavated, which are lighter than the areas surrounding them, okay? Now, do not uh, make the mistake, however, of looking at this and looking at this and looking at this and that and thinking that those are part of the Roman camps. These are the piles of rubble that we cleared in our excavations, the piles of stones that we piled up. So these do not belong, this, uh, this, 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 those do not belong. Instead, we will focus on the units that we did excavate. So what did we excavate and find? Well, remember that in the center of the camp, you're going to have the most important units. So part of our attention focused on the area of the center of the camp, and now I'm going to show you four of the structures in the center area. One, two, three, Four. So the first unit is, number one, the Praetorium, or the tent unit of Flavia Silva. This was the living quarters of the commander at Masada. You see it's located here, it's located here. I will show you why we were able to identify it as that. Um, by the way, it was pretty easy to identify what each of these things was because the Roman army was so standardized. So every Roman military camp is laid out with these units located in the same place within the camp. But our identification of this as the Praetorium, you will see, was confirmed by what we found inside of it. Next to the Praetorium, we excavated the Tribunal 2, which you see here, we'll come back to that. Three is the officer's mess, the triclinium or dining room for the officers. Four here is the Principia or camp headquarters. And five is a row of contubernia or tent units that belong to the regular enlisted men. So now let's take a look at each of these in that order, starting with the Praetorium. Here is the Praetorium as it looks now. Does not look very impressive now, but it is located in the right position within the camp. Uh, it was mostly stripped of its stones, by the way, for the wall of F2. So when they built that wall of F2, they took a lot of the stones and they used them in the wall of F2. But we were able to identify this as the Praetorium because of what we found inside it. Basically, we found the nicest stuff in this tent unit. So not surprisingly, the commander uh, at Masada had the nicest stuff. He was living very well. And among the things that we found in this tent unit were uh, beautiful painted Nabataean bowls, this eggshell thin ware with beautiful painted designs for uh, drinking and for eating out of. And my personal favorite, 
Uh, this little amphoriscos, or uh, it's, it's basically a little wine jar, uh, which is painted with an ivy leaf decoration, and I like to imagine Flavia Silva's slave pouring his wine for him out of this jar. We also found beautiful luxury glass imported from Italy in this tent unit. Can you imagine schlepping beautiful glass dishes all the way to Masada? So, you know, nothing too good for the commander. So uh, at any rate, we were able to confirm that this was the Praetorium. And another thing, by the way, that indicated that it was the Praetorium, because right next to it, here you see to the right, and here you see it, right next to it was the tribunal. What was the tribunal? The tribunal was a platform, a podium, where Flavia Silva could stand and address his men. So basically, the men would muster around the area of the tribunal, and Flavia Silva would go up on top of the tribunal, and he would address them, and he would review the troops, and they would muster there. So uh, the proximity of the tribunal to the praetorium, again, indicated that this was indeed the praetorium, the camp headquarters, uh, the place where Flavia Silva lived. Just inside of and partly covered by the later wall of F2 was the Principia. This is the, uh, the building that was used as the headquarters during the siege. It was pretty empty of finds, but it was the only unit that we uncovered that was plastered. You can see the white plaster on the walls and on the floor here. All the rest just had dirt floors and, and nothing on the walls. So this was very unusual. And uh, also partly covered by the later wall of F2 was the triclinium or the officer's mess, which had been stripped down to its foundations when they built the later wall of F2. So they took all of the, wall, all of the stones from the walls here and built them into wall, the wall of F2. But you can still see the layout, the shape here, which is the shape of the Greek letter pi or the Hebrew letter chet so that it's sort of like a big rectangle, but it's open at one end, and it's open actually in the direction facing the mountain of Masada. And originally, you would have had dining couches built up against the insides of these three walls, and the officers would have reclined and dined. And as they reclined and dined, they would have then been looking out towards Masada. So how did the regular enlisted men live? Now, uh, we excavated a row of small tent units, which are called contubernia. What is a contubernium? A legion, uh, again, consisted of approximately 5,000 men. How do you maneuver with 5,000 men in the field? It's too big. You have to subdivide it. So just like in today, the military, you have smaller and smaller subdivisions of every kind of unit, so it was in a legion. The legion was subdivided into smaller and smaller groups, and the smallest subdivision, the smallest group, operating group, within a legion was called a contubernium. A contubernium consisted of a group of eight men who marched together, uh, who lived together, who pitched their tent together in the field. So each one of these units, each one of these contubernia, housed a group of eight men. Now, each one of these contubernia consisted of a main room, which you see here, which has a bench surrounding the three walls of the interior made of dirt and stones and with a little space for standing in the middle. And in the front of it, you had a porch, which you can see here. So in the front of each one was a little porch or an open space that was enclosed. So that's what each of these consisted of. Now, these benches inside the contubernium were used both for sleeping and for eating, because remember that the Romans reclined when they dined. So they reclined on these benches inside the tent to eat, and they also slept on top of those benches. Now, in order to give you a sense of scale, I put my book, The Clan of the Cave Bear, on top of the bench here, right? And I want you to notice that in terms of the scale, there is no way that eight Roman soldiers could possibly all fit onto that bench at one time. And in fact, the units were not intended to, to accommodate all eight men at one time. Because just like in a submarine today, the men ate and slept in shifts. So at any given time, some of the men were out on active duty, and some of the men were back inside the tent, and that's why they aren't that big. In the front of each one of the contubernia was a little porch or an enclosed kind of a court, uh, and in the corner of each one of these porches, there was a burnt area. Do you see it, a hearth? This is where the men prepared their food. 
So you can imagine them, and uh, legionaries, by the way, were equipped with mess kits, so you have to imagine them preparing their food in the hearth in the courtyard in front of the entrance to their tent unit. Now, you're probably wondering if we found military equipment in our excavations, and the short answer is we did not find much, which is not surprising. What army goes on campaign and leaves their military equipment behind after it's over? Of course not. So when the siege of Masada ended, the Roman army took their equipment with them, so we didn't find a lot of military equipment in our excavations. But we did find very conspicuously piled in and around the tent units these river pebbles, which are large pebbles, each one about the size of a large egg, and they were very conspicuous. And at the time, we had some discussion about what these were, and we did research and realized that what these were were slingshot stones. And of course, they didn't have any inherent value, they were just pebbles, so after the siege ended, the Romans left those behind. Now, we did not find much military equipment in our excavations, but when Yiga Eliadine excavated the top of Masada in the 1960s, he did find a lot of military equipment. He found a lot of military equipment that was left on top of the mountain because of the battle, the siege, that took place in connection with the fall of the mountain. And this is actually how I originally got involved in the story of Masada. So basically what happens is, is that Yiga Yadin died in 1984 without ever having published a full report on his excavations at Masada. As you may know, he published a popular book, he published some preliminary reports, but he never published a full and final scientific report on his excavations. After Yadin died in 1984, the material from his excavations was given to other archaeologists at the Hebrew University, Yadin's home institution, for publication. So basically, two archaeologists at the Hebrew University were put in charge of overseeing the publication of the material from Yadin's excavations at Masada. Now remember, Yadin died in 1984. In 1985, I arrived in Jerusalem to start work on my dissertation, which again is a pen dissertation. Um, but my dissertation had nothing to do with any of this. My dissertation was on, well, okay, you want to go to sleep now. Here, I'll start to tell you. No, the title of the dissertation was A Typology of the Late Roman and Byzantine Pottery of Jerusalem. Anyway, it was on a completely different topic. So what happened is I was sitting in the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It's where I had done my undergraduate degree. And uh, these two archaeologists who were my former professors from when I was an undergraduate had been put in charge of overseeing the publication. And this had all just started. And they were looking for people to work on the material from Yadin's excavations for publication. So one day, one of them comes to me and he says, uh, you know, we're looking for people to work on the publication. Are you interested? And I should have said no, because I need to work on my dissertation. But I said, oh, hmm, Masada, what do you have? Now, actually, what I wanted was, believe it or not, the Byzantine pottery. There's a Byzantine monastery on top of Masada. And I was doing Byzantine pottery for my dissertation. So believe it or not, I actually wanted the Byzantine pottery. But it was taken, so I couldn't have it. So, uh, so they said, well, you can't have the Byzantine pottery. Somebody else is doing it. But we have a lot of other stuff. So I said, well, what, what else do you have? So they started to rattle off, well, we've got this, we've got that, we've got glass, we've got wood, we've got this, we've got that. And among the things that they mentioned was military equipment. And I didn't know anything about military equipment. I was a pottery person. Um, but I thought military equipment sounded interesting. Yiga El Yadin had uh, actually been an expert on ancient warfare, among other things. And so I thought, well, OK, actually, military equipment sounds interesting. I'll take the military equipment. So together with, a couple, with uh, another Israeli colleague, uh, we worked on the publication of the military equipment from Yadin's excavations at Masada. And that was published as part of the Masada Final Reports. There's a big series of volumes now, a series of volumes of the Masada Final Reports from Yadin's excavations. And and our report on the military equipment was published in that. What I want to show you now is some of what Yadin found in his excavations, which we worked on for publication. Because again, we didn't find much military equipment in our excavations, but Yadin found quite a bit. So what did he find? So one of the things that Yadin found a lot of were these things. They don't look very impressive. They're kind of small, actually. You know, They're maybe like an inch big or something. So they're not very big. Um, what these are are iron arrowheads. And he literally found hundreds of these iron arrowheads in his excavations. They're all basically the same type. They are a characteristic Roman type called a barbed wing trilobate 
uh, arrowhead, which means that they have three barbed wingtips to stick into your flesh. So if you're shot, it sticks into your flesh and you can't pull it out. Um, and they have a long tang, this long thing here, that was originally inserted into a wooden shaft. And these on the right are reconstructed modern wooden shafts to give you an impression of what they looked like originally. Um, think of these as bullets. That's really what they're analogous to. So while the siege is going on, the Jews and the Romans are firing back at each other, right? The archers are firing back and forth, and they're firing arrows, shooting arrows back and forth at each other. So it's not surprising that Yadin found hundreds of these because that's what they were firing back and forth at each other while the siege is going on. Yadin also found hundreds of these, and in the slide they look gigantic. It's very misleading. They're tiny little things. Um, these are made of bronze. You can see that they all have holes at the top. And what these are are scales of armor, scales of armor. And originally, uh, these would have been sewed, so they have holes, because they would have been sewed onto a cloth or a leather backing, and they would have overlapped. Scale armor in this period, by the way, is characteristic of auxiliary soldiers, not legionaries. Legionaries wore a different kind of armor, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Yadin also found this. This does not look impressive, but actually it's a very rare find. This is an almost complete iron sword. So you see the blade here. Iron, of course, is the least stable of, of the uh, metals, so it corrodes very easily. That's why also the iron arrowheads are so corroded. Um, so this is very corroded, but you see the blade. And originally it had a tang, which is partly broken, but you see it had a tang, and it would have had a bone or a wooden handle. So the tang would have been stuck into a bone or a wooden handle, and the handle's gone. Now, this again is the sort of equipment that you know a legionary or, or a soldier would have carried. If you were a soldier and you were equipped with a sword, how did you uh, carry it when you didn't actually use it? So when you weren't actually using it, how did you, what did you do with it, right? How did you carry it on your person? Now, Roman soldiers, and you'll see this in a little while, Roman soldiers wore a belt around their waist. And attached to the belt was a leather uh, holster, if you wish, a leather uh, scabbard to hold the sword. So uh, the sword, when a soldier wasn't using it, would have been in its leather holster attached to the belt. But if you stick a sword into leather, the edges and tip of the sword are going to slice right through, the, right through the leather. So what do you do? You reinforce the edges of the leather with a strip of metal so that, the, uh, so that it won't cut through. Now, why did I go into all of that? Because when this sword was lost 2,000 years ago, it apparently was in its leather scabbard. The leather disintegrated, disappeared, but if you look very closely, you can still see part of the metal reinforcement along the edge stuck to the edge of the sword. Yadin also found this, which is a scabbard shape. This is a, the metal reinforced tip of a leather scabbard for a sword. And this is no ordinary scabbard shape. This scabbard shape is decorated with cutout designs that would have created a contrast between the dark leather backing and the lighter color of the metal. In fact, I did research on this scabbard shape and found that the parallels for it come from Italy in this very same period, and there is no doubt that this scabbard shape originally belonged to some legionary officer. Now, I found out a lot of really interesting things when I was doing my research on uh, the military equipment from Masada. Um, I found, for example, that in Europe, there are a lot of groups that do reenactments of the Roman army. These guys get dressed up like Roman soldiers, and they actually go out on mock military campaigns, sort of like our Civil War buffs in this country do, you know? Um, and so you can see some of these guys here in Europe who are dressed up as legionaries, and I'm going to come back to them in just a minute. Um, a second thing that I found out that was very interesting is that uh, the study of the Roman army and Roman military equipment is overwhelmingly dominated by male scholars. Um, it's not that women are excluded or made to feel unwelcome in any way. That's not it at all. Um, I think it's just a boy thing. I think it just, I think it just attracts men. Um, and I also found, by the way, very interesting, that the overwhelming majority of scholars who specialize in the Roman army and Roman military equipment are European scholars, and especially 
British and German scholars. And it's very interesting to think about why the British and the German Empire, Empire, anyway, are so fascinated with the Roman army. Anyway, okay, so I found out a lot of really interesting things. Now, I want you to look at how these guys at the bottom, these guys who are legionaries, are dressed up. Um, so how are they equipped? Okay, so on, now let's first of all look at their defensive equipment and then we'll look at their offensive equipment. So on their heads they're wearing uh, a helmet which has gigantic cheek pieces, and in fact in Camp F we, we did find one of these kinds of cheek pieces. On the upper part of their body they're wearing armor, but it's not the scale armor like we saw before. Can you see that it's overlapping metal strips? This is a kind of armor that's called segmented armor, lorica segmentata, and this is the characteristic armor worn by legionaries in this period, and you see that it's tied with these tie hooks at the front. And then you see that um, below that, on the lower part of their body here, they're wearing a short tunic. Tunics were the universal dress worn by everybody in the Roman world, men and women alike. Tunics differed, however, in length. So for example, if you were a woman, typically you would wear a longer tunic, or maybe a priest, you would wear a longer tunic. If you were a slave or a soldier, you would wear a shorter tunic because you needed the mobility. So they're wearing a tunic uh, on their, the lower part of their body, and then around their waist, they have a belt, right? And attached to the belt are a number of things, and we'll come back to what's attached to the belt. But uh, I want you to notice that at the front of the belt are these strips, these leather strips that have uh, metal studs on them, and this is a decorated apron. And there's a controversy about what the purpose of the apron was. Um, some scholars think that it was to protect the genitals, and some scholars think that it was to, when they moved, it made noise. The studs would make noise and it would scare the enemy. And uh, actually, there are groups in the U.S. that do the reenactments and get dressed up as Roman soldiers do. And uh, I once got, I gave this lecture in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts a couple of years ago, and there was a group there of these guys who were dressed up like Roman legionaries. And when I said that, uh, that you know, this was in order to protect the genitals, they started to argue with me about it, and I said, well, I'm not going to argue with you guys, about, I mean, really, so I can't argue with you about that, but anyway, so uh, that's, but those are the theories about why they had the apron. Attached to the apron were a couple of their defensive weapons, so on one side, you had a short dagger, and on the other side, you had the sword, right, and here you see the sword in the scabbard, and you see the scabbard shape, the tip, right, okay, and then you see that the legs are completely unprotected, and that's for the purposes of mobility. And on their feet, they wore heavy nailed sandals. So that's how they're dressed. And then what are they carrying? In the left hand, they're carrying a tall rectangular shield, which provides protection for the unprotected part of the body. And in their right hand, they're holding a tall thing that looks like a big spear, which is called a pilum which was the main piece of offensive military equipment that uh, Roman legionaries were, were given. And uh, so basically the idea was, was that you would approach your enemy, you would first either throw or thrust the pilum at them and try and immobilize them and then finish the, take your sword and finish them off in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right, so that's the way it worked. Now, I want you to imagine these guys have now arrived at the foot of Masada. Okay, so the mountain is sealed off, right? You got the circumvallation wall, they got their camps, and now what? Now, at this point, if this were just an ordinary siege, what would the Romans have done? Well, what they might have done at this point, they sealed off the mountain, nobody can escape, nobody can get in. What they might have done at this point would simply be to, sim to wait, okay, sit back and wait, and wait for the people who are being besieged to start running out of supplies, run out of food and water, in other words, starve them into surrender, right? But that wasn't going to work at Masada. Why wasn't it going to work at Masada? For the reason that I explained to you earlier. When the Jewish rebels took over the top of Masada at the beginning of the revolt, what did they find? They found all of those storehouses that Herod had provided with food, still stocked with food that was good to eat, and all of those cisterns filled with water. So the Jewish rebels on top of Masada could hold out for years, but the Romans at the foot of Masada have supply lines going for miles and miles and miles, bringing in food and water every day by pack animal and boat across the Dead Sea. So obviously the Romans could not sit back and starve 
the rebels into surrender, they had to make a quick end of it. They had to attack the mountain. How do you attack the mountain? Now here your problem is going to be that, remember that Herod built that casemate wall around the edge of the mountain. So even if you manage to get up to the top of the mountain, you still have to break through that fortification wall. That means that you have to get siege machinery up to the top of the mountain. By siege machinery, I mean machinery that is going to batter through that fortification wall. That's no easy feat. Now, how are you going to do that? Those of you who have been to Masada know that one of the ways to access it is by way of a path on the eastern side that you still can go up today called the Snake Path which is appropriately called the snake path because it winds its way around back and forth and switchbacks till it gets to the top. It's very steep, it's a, it's a narrow path, right? Imagine the Romans trying to climb up the snake path equipped like this with the siege machinery that they have to set up at the top in order to break through the wall and of course, the Jews on top of the mountain weren't just sitting around twiddling their thumbs, they were throwing stones and anything else they could get their hands on down onto the Romans, so that wasn't going to work. The Romans could not take Masada by way of the existing paths. And at this point then, the commander at Masada, Flavia Silva, noticed that on the western side of the mountain, there was already a natural white hill not too far from the top of the mountain. He ordered his men to bring in dirt and stones and to fill up the space between that hill and the top of the mountain to create a gently sloping ramp. A ramp that had a gentle enough slope so that the siege machinery could be pushed up to the top of it, that was wide enough so that the Romans could march several men across. And this is what the Romans did. So here you see the, uh, the ramp. Here you see uh, another view of the ramp from the side. And by the way, those of you who went to Masada, and if your tour guides told you that Jewish slaves built the ramp, that is not true. Roman soldiers built the ramp. All of the siege works were built by the Romans because this is what the Romans were trained to do. It would have been very efficient, inefficient, to leave this to anybody else. There were Jewish slaves in the siege of Masada, but they were doing things like going and fetching water and stuff like that. The siege works were built by the Roman army. Okay? So the ramp was built by the Roman soldiers. And here you see, uh, to give you an idea, here's the ramp as it exists today. You can still climb up uh, Masada by way of the ramp. And by the way, you can see that the ramp falls short of the top of Masada. Originally, it reached higher. It did not originally reach to the top, but originally it did reach higher. It has been brought lower by earthquakes since antiquity, but it did reach somewhat higher. It did not reach the top, however. At the top of the ramp, the Romans then built a big stone podium, and on top of that stone podium, they set up the battering ram. And here you see an example of what a, a battering ram would look like. So you have to imagine at the top of the ramp then, a big stone podium, and then the battering ram on top of that set up to batter through the wall. One of the things that we did in our excavation was, again, something that nobody had ever done. We actually cut a section through the ramp to see how it was built. Uh, the excavation of the ramp was very difficult. It was done by one of my colleagues from Northwest College in Wyoming with students and also the assistants of Bedouin. Very difficult because of the steepness of the slope here. Uh, very, very hard to work. Um, you can see a view of our team here cutting the section through the ramp. Today, if you go to the ramp and you walk up it, it looks like, just like you see here, this very fine powdery white dust that sort of poofs up when you walk up it, mixed with small stones, that's what it looks like. But when we cut a section through it, we found that it was actually constructed of wooden boxes filled with stones. Terraced wooden boxes filled with stones. So what did they do? They took pieces of wood, and you see the pieces of wood sticking out here. They took pieces of wood. All of this is desert wood. All of it's local, so acacia, date palm, stuff like that. Um, and they laid pieces of the wood flat, and then they took other pieces of wood and they stuck them into the ground vertically to create large boxes and then each of these boxes was filled up with stones, each one of these stones about the size that one man can pick up and carry. And these boxes were then terraced 
to create the ramp. So that's how the ramp was created. To me, the most amazing thing was, when we did this section, was to look at the wood. This wood looked like it had been chopped down yesterday, but it's 2,000-year-old wood. So the Romans completed the construction of the ramp. They erected the siege machinery at the top, the battering ram. And why all those arrowheads from Yadin's excavations? Because while all of this is going on, what's happening? There is constant shooting of arrows back and forth between the Jews and the Romans, right? They're firing at each other. So the Jews are trying to prevent the ramp from going up and, and the battering ram from being erected. So they're shooting down arrows. The Romans, likewise, are shooting up to protect their guys. The Romans also, by the way, used ballistas, cannon shot, stones, right? Giant torsion machines to throw stones at the rebels to keep their heads down, cover fire, right? So all of that was found in Yadin's excavations. That's what's connected with the siege. But the Romans then managed to do it. They battered a hole through the wall at the top of the siege ramp. And at this point, what happened? At this point, the Jews realized that the mountain was going to fall. And at this point, the leader of the Jewish rebels on top of Masada, a man named Eleazar ben Yair, convened all of the men together, perhaps in this room, which Yadin identified as a synagogue, an assembly hall on top of the mountain. So Eleazar ben Yair convened all of the men together, and he gave them a speech in which he convinced them that it would be better for them to commit suicide before the Romans took the mountain than to let themselves and their wives and children fall into the hands of the Romans and be slaughtered or sold into slavery or whatever else. And Eleazar ben Yair convinced them to do this. So all of the men made a suicide pact, and they drew lots. And out of the men, 10 men killed all of the others. And then they, uh, sorry, let me start again. First of all, before we even get to the lots, the men all agreed that they should commit suicide, so the first thing they did, actually, was to kill their wives and children. Each man killed his wife and, children, his wife and his children. Then the men got together and they drew lots, and out of them, 10 men killed all of the other men. And then those 10 remaining men drew lots again, and out of them, one man killed the other nine men, and finally committed suicide himself. Now, by the way, notice that there's technically only one suicide at Masada. That is, technically, there's only one man who dies at his own hand on top of Masada. Okay, so the story goes, when the Romans came up to the top of the mountain, they found that everybody had committed suicide. Well, wait a minute. If everybody committed suicide, how do we know the suicide story? So the story goes that not everybody actually committed suicide. There were a couple of old women and children who overheard the plans to commit suicide and hid out in a cistern on the side of the mountain. And when the Romans came up and took the mountain, they gave themselves up and they told them the story. So how do we know the story? We know the story because eventually, either directly or indirectly, this story was reported to a famous ancient Jewish historian named Flavius Josephus. It is Josephus who tells us the mass suicide story at Masada. Now, if you know anything about Masada and about Josephus, you know that in recent years, there's been a lot of controversy about the mass suicide story at Masada. Why? Because Josephus is the only source we have for the mass suicide story at Masada. He is the only ancient author who reports the story. And so some scholars have questioned whether the mass suicide at Masada ever actually took place. Now, in order to explain the controversy to you, let me explain a little bit about Josephus, and then we'll talk about the controversy. So who exactly was Josephus? Very interesting guy. Flavius Josephus was originally born as a Jew named Joseph, son of Mattathias. That was his Jewish name, Yosef ben Matitiahu. He was born in the year 37 AD to a wealthy, aristocratic, priestly family. And according to himself, his autobiography, he was a precocious and uh, intelligent child. When the first Jewish revolt broke out against the Romans in the year 66 AD, 
The Jews set up a provisional government because, of course, no more Roman government. They had to set up their own government. And they divided the country into districts. They placed Joseph in charge of Galilee. So he was put in charge of Galilee, overseeing Galilee. After the revolt broke out in 66, what happens? The Romans then send troops to put down the revolt. The commander, the general, who was put in charge of leading the Roman troops was a man named Vespasian. Vespasian arrives in the country, sets out from Antioch in Syria, and starts moving south to put down the revolt. So the first part of the country that was in the line of the Romans was Galilee, the area under Joseph's command. One by one, the towns and villages in Galilee fell to the Romans. The Jews were no match for the Romans. They were outnumbered, they were out-equipped, they were outmanned, they, it was hopeless. Until finally, Joseph found himself holed up in a cistern on the side of the last fortress still under his control in Galilee, a fortress called Jotapata or Yodfat. There, the soldiers under Joseph's command decided that they would rather commit suicide than give themselves up alive to the Romans. Sound familiar? And so they drew lots, and somehow, as Joseph himself later reports, either through fate or contrivance, he drew the last lot. And at that point, instead of committing suicide, he gave himself up alive to the Romans. That's why he's considered a traitor to the Jews. So Joseph was then led before Vespasian, the Roman general. Why didn't Vespasian simply kill Joseph outright? Well, Joseph was very clever. When led before Vespasian, Joseph predicted that one day Vespasian would become emperor of the Roman Empire. Why was this so clever? Well, we're now in the year 67 AD. Who's emperor in Rome in the year 67 AD? If you remember your Roman history, Nero. It is three years after the great fire in Rome, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Joseph knew that Nero was very unpopular and unlikely to last much longer. He also suspected, rightly, that Vespasian, as a powerful general, would like to be emperor. And so Vespasian, instead of having Joseph put to death, took him alive into captivity. The following year, 68, Nero dies. And the year after that, 69, Vespasian is proclaimed emperor of the Roman Empire. And at that point, he sets Joseph free. Joseph eventually goes to live in Rome, where he becomes a client of the imperial family, Vespasian's family, including adopting their family name. Vespasian founded the Flavian dynasty. And so Joseph, son of Mattathias, becomes known as Flavius Josephus. And he was then commissioned by the Romans to write a series of history books of the Jewish people. He wrote several works. The most important ones that have come down to us are The Jewish War, which is a seven-volume work on the first Jewish revolt against the Romans, and which ends with the mass suicide at Masada. His other important work is Jewish Antiquities, which is a history of the Jewish people beginning with creation. Joseph, Josephus, is our only source, the only ancient author who describes the mass suicide at Masada. And so, as I said, some scholars now question whether the mass suicide ever occurred. How reliable is Josephus' account of this mass suicide? Now, here's the thing. Um, these scholars who question Josephus's reliability with regard to the mass suicide story have pointed out that if you look at Josephus's works, you see that there are various episodes that he reports which end with mass suicides. So, for example, at Gamla, there's a mass suicide. At Jotapata, there's a mass suicide. There's, a, there's mass suicides all over the place. So these scholars have asked, is it possible that all of these people really were committing mass suicide? Or could it be that Josephus invented this as a literary device to make the story more exciting? It's true, it is exciting. If it wasn't exciting, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you about Masada right now, right? That's why everybody knows about Masada. So it worked, okay? So if it wasn't a literary device, it worked. But so is it really true or not, right? Now, 
So you're asking yourself, well, gee, is there any way of telling whether, you know, this really is, how, how could we know? Well, some people might say, well, gee, but, you know, Josephus was writing for the Romans. You know, he was, he was a client of the imperial family. They're over his, looking over his shoulder. They're reading what he's writing. How could Josephus have fabricated an ending to a story, you know, something that didn't happen when the Romans were right there? Wouldn't they have objected that he invented an ending that never actually happened? But you see there, the problem is, you're expecting objectivity of ancient Roman authors, which they themselves didn't expect. In other words, Romans read history to be entertained. That is why ancient authors, including ancient Greek authors from Herodotus on, focus on things that are different and exotic and bizarre, not mundane, because they're writing to entertain people. The Romans did not read history with the expectation of objectivity, whatever that is, of objectivity that we have today. Right? So first of all, the Romans wouldn't necessarily have objected. But then you wonder, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't the Romans have objected to Josephus fabricating an ending to a story which makes the Jews look noble and heroic in death? that elevates the Jews in the eyes of the Romans? Because when you read the mass suicide story, really it makes the Jews look like, wow, they're so great because they preferred to commit suicide at their own hands rather than fall into the hands of the Romans. So wouldn't the Romans have objected to that? But the problem with that is you see, it actually works for the Romans or it would work for the Romans because it makes the Romans look even better. You know, there's no glory in defeating a weak, wimpy enemy. Right? Your victory is elevated if your enemy is noble and heroic, so your own victory over that enemy is even better. Right? So now you're probably wondering, well, wait a minute, so doesn't archaeology tell us whether the mass suicide took place or not? Right? Don't we have archaeological evidence that tells us? And you know, here the problem is that you can take the same archaeological evidence and interpret it either way depending on how you interpret the mass suicide. So to give you a couple of examples, when Yigael Yadin excavated the top of Masada, he did not find the remains of 967 skeletons. He did not. What did he find? He found three skeletons on the lowest terrace of the northern palace, which almost certainly are the remains of Jewish rebel family. And he found another group of skeletons, somewhere between five to 25 skeletons in a cistern on the side of the mountain. Not clear who those guys were. And that's it, that's all he found. So what did Yadin say? Yadin believed literally in Josephus' story. So he thought the mass suicide had actually occurred the way that Josephus reported it. So Yadin's explanation was, well, after the top of the mountain fell to the Romans, the Romans left a garrison on top of the mountain for a couple of decades. Do you think they would have left rotting corpses lying around? Of course, of course not. They would have cleared them away and either burned them or buried them in a mass pit or something. So that was Yadin's explanation. Well, now let's imagine that Josephus' story is fabricated and that there was no mass suicide. So the Romans break through the wall and they come up to the top and there's a big fight and some Jews are killed and others are led away into slavery. Same thing. They would have cleaned up the skeletons. So that doesn't help. And those of you who've been to Masada when you were there, did your uh, tour guide take you to a room where they found the quote unquote lots? Right? I think they're giving me a, a, a hint here. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, where they found the lots. So here you see a group of the uh, lots. And what are the lots? This is a group of inscribed potsherds, ostraca, which are inscribed in Hebrew with names. And very interesting, by the way, uh, one of the names is Ben Yair. Yigael Yadin interpreted these as the lots that those Jews you know, pulled at the end in order to decide who commits suicide and who kills the others, okay? Um, the problem is, is that there are more than 10 potsherds in this group. There's either 11 or 12. And the person who published these in the end was not able to determine that they are in fact lots because we have other inscribed potsherds that were found in Yadin's excavations at Masada, which were used for various purposes, meal ration tickets and all sorts of stuff like that. So maybe they were the lots, but maybe not. So in the end, you can actually take the very same archaeological evidence and interpret it either way depending on how you interpret Josephus, and so people ask me, what do I think? 
Do I think that they committed mass suicide or not? And you know what I say? I don't know, and I don't care. Because it's not a question that archaeology can answer. Archaeology cannot answer this question. It is a matter of how you evaluate Josephus as a historian, and I will leave that to the Josephus scholars to figure out. So thank you very much.